Good morning, welcome to the Australian Early Finance Briefing for Saturday the 28th of November. My name's Nick here in Melbourne, starting with the ASX and despite losing one day or almost losing one day due to a technical outage of trading, the ASX 200 index is actually up 11.7% month to date. We still have one more trading day to go on Monday for the month, but it's up really strongly relative to the MSCI World Index in AUD terms, which is up only 7.7%, so so ahead by 4%. Why is that? Well, when you look at this sort of thematic shift that we've seen occurring in global markets over November, it explains why Australia is now all of a sudden outperforming when it has been underperforming. Australia does not have much tech stocks, and that's what we've seen doing so well this year. Absolutely bereft of tech here. In fact, according to Bloomberg, the tech sector accounts for just 4.1% of the ASX 200, whereas the S&P 500 in the US takes 27%, so over five times more there. Now, the other thing to look at, what is Australia really overweight in? Thanks, Miners Energy. They account for 51.2% of the Australian index, so particularly the banks and energy, they have been the huge beneficiaries of this sort of thematic sort of reversal that we've seen. So maybe instead of looking at, at sort of buying specific sectors in the US, when we're looking at this sort of accessing this, this change in investor sentiment, it might be better just to look here in Australia and just buy up our index because it seems to be the one that will be the big recovery sort of one going forward into 2021 with the vaccines coming out, travel picking up, and false dropping. Moving to Chinese relations now and the continuing economic coercion initiatives undertaken by the Chinese Communist Party against Australia seem to be getting ramped up. Yesterday we saw a 200% tariff placed on some Australian wines and it seems to be no end in sight for these sorts of coercive activities undertaken by the party. Now, the Citibank analysts have issued a note sort of quantifying the impacts of, of these sort of measures on GDP. And they suggest that in their baseline scenario, there'd be a 10% drop in total exports to China over the next 12 months without any restrictions in iron ore shipments. This would have a very minor impact on growth with only a negative 0.33% impact on nominal GDP growth. But they say a downside scenario could lead to a 50% drop in exports to China that would include iron ore. And this would, as they say, this would cause Australia's total merchandise exports to decline by 20%, leading to a $76 billion loss in export, export earnings causing a sizable 3.8% hit to nominal GDP. And if that was to happen, then there would be a drop in the Australian dollar, which a lot of other people in other sectors would love to see, and that they suggest this drop would be around 16 cents compared to their baseline scenario. But it does seem to be there's a lot of sort of a chorus out there about the potential of diversification and we are becoming increasingly dependent on Chinese trade or certainly they're taking up a bigger proportion of our exports than they ever have in the past. It could be more that they're more dependent on us, particularly in iron ore. But the Commonwealth Bank has come up with a note suggesting that they don't see Chinese coercion as actually having such a big impact on our economy. And that's because already without these trade in positions, there are still lots of growth in other markets, particularly India and other Asian nations. And our exports are you know, much sought after across the world. And it just happens to be that China is such a large market that they're taking up a lot, but it doesn't mean we're dependent on them and there's no one else to buy it. Whereas the other way around, iron ore, really, if China wants cheap iron ore, there's only one place to go and that's us. So they're quite stuck in that situation. We have a lot more flexibility in terms of most of our exports.
So CBA mentions that you know, even in terms of educational exports, which are huge for Sydney and Melbourne, that there's actually a big increase in, in students from India, Nepal, Brazil and Vietnam, and that could be increased a lot. So they mentioned that in the year to April, student enrolments from India have risen by 20.1% and also large rises from Vietnam. So it just shows you how quickly these student flows can change, they mentioned. That's your early update for Saturday. Have a great weekend. This podcast is for investment professionals only and should not be relied upon by private investors. The podcast is provided for informational purposes only and does not constitute financial advice. The values of investments can go up or down, so you may get back less than you initially invest.